Alright guys, welcome to what is going to be the first part of Project E55 ASL and just to start off by explaining to you the reason behind the name. The joke goes back a couple of years when I used to drive my Mercedes SL and I had a couple of these annoying friends that drive Mazda Miatas and think it's the fastest car in the world just because it's 50 kilograms lighter than every other car. And they used to make fun of me for driving an 1800 kilogram car and thinking it's sporty lightweight because SL in the name SL500 stands for sporty lightweight. But now starting this new project, I thought it was a really good time to get back to them and show them what an actually sporty lightweight Mercedes would be like, since this car would be way lighter than any Miata out there, it's gonna weigh somewhere around 900 kilograms. It's definitely gonna be way more powerful than most cars out there, so that's why I decided to call it actually sporty lightweight. Um, I still kept the name E55 in there because so much of this car is based on my E55. Well, the engine is actually from a CLS 55, transmissions from a 350Z, steering rack is actually from a Mazda. But anyways, most of it is still based on my E55, so I guess it still makes the name somewhat appropriate. Now, if you have no idea what this project is about, I already made a previous video explaining the design of the project and how I plan to make it. If you want to see that, you can click the video card, but for now, let's just get right into the video. So the job at hand for this first part is to try to get that engine started using all of this. And um, this is the entire wiring harness out of the E55. Um, it's a pretty complicated and a pretty big wiring harness because it starts all the way back from the trunk, that's where the battery goes, and it goes all the way till the engine bay. It's all pretty much just one wiring harness t all tied together. But the reason why I'm trying to um, get the engine started with this wiring harness and trying to sort it out is because I need to get rid of as much of it as I can because there's a lot of wires in there that I don't even need for this um, next project. Since this car had all these weird features like airbags in the seats and there's actually pretty much a computer for every door even that um, controls the features on that door. Um, the whole wiring is extremely complicated and um, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there that I don't even need. So the goal for this video is to um, first try to connect this wiring harness exactly like it goes in the car and try to get the engine started with this wiring harness using the same ECU and using all the same modules that uh, were in this car. Um, so once I get to that point then I can start um, deleting stuff from the wiring harness and see how much I can get away with. Um, and still keep the engine running and keep all the features that I need in the car running like the instrument cluster maybe uh, maybe some of the functions of the steering wheel and um, yeah basically all that stuff. So I first started off by trying to organize the wiring harness a little better so I could make sense of where each wire goes and then once most of the modules were plugged in I got to this um, assembling this box that goes in the engine bay this is where the um, fuse box and also the ECU and the ESP module go. So yeah it's pretty much just about plugging everything back in its proper places. So after a few hours of trying to connect all the wires, I have connected everything now exactly like it would go in the car. Uh, so that's the engine over there. I've connected the ECU and everything over there. That's the instrument cluster, the steering column, and yeah, pretty much everything that's in the car, it is over here. The only things missing over here right now are just going to be the ESP module. Someone actually borrowed that from me, so I don't have that right now. And all the door modules, I cut those off because the door modules, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to be using those since there's... Uh, no doors on this car, there's going to be no windows to roll up or down, there's going to be no door locks. But everything else is there, even the transmission is there actually, and it's connected just like it would be in the car. And this is the battery at the back. There's actually two batteries in this car. There's one battery that goes in the engine bay, that's the one over there. And the other battery is the battery that goes in the trunk, that's the one over there. And oh, by the way, for all the grounding points, I have grounded them using this um, strip over here. And um, yeah, basically that strip is the chassis ground now. So all the points that usually get grounded to the chassis, I've grounded them to this thing. So now the only thing left is to connect the negative terminal of the battery and hope that nothing explodes. Um, so yeah, here we go. Oh. That's that's the clock on the instrument cluster. I thought something was about to explode, but that's just the clock. Yeah, that's what it does every time you um, take off the battery and put it back on. So that's normal. So now I guess there's just one more thing left to do to put the key in the car, or well, not the car, whatever's left of the car, and see if it actually turns on. Um, so yeah, here we go. All right, so that's good. That noise was the steering column, like the lock on the steering column deactivating. So that's good. That means that it's detected the key and it knows that no one's trying to steal the car at least. So turn the key. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. I turned it too much. I was actually um, starting to crank the engine. But that's actually good to see that the engine was cranking though. Um, I have a few messages on the instrument cluster. It says with it workshop battery. That might be actually, I know why that is. Um, that's because the cables for the um, battery controller, someone cut those cables. I had the car listed for a part out and 
yeah, the guy cut the wiring harness. I, I connected like a few of the cables back, but a few of the cables are missing. I guess that's why that message is there. Let's see what other messages we have. Display malfunction visit workshop. Um, that might be because of some other missing modules too. And well, only two messages. That's funny. I was expecting a bit more because there's a few other modules missing too, but I guess um, it's not looking for those modules right now. Or maybe it just doesn't care to show a message about them. But yeah, the tall body is humming normally like it should. Um, that means that uh, the engine and all its sensors should be getting the proper voltages. Let me just try pressing the accelerator and see if the throttle actually moves. One sec. Perfect. Okay, so I guess I'll call it a day over here for me because the thing is that I still have to wait for my ESP module. Someone has to um, drop it by tomorrow. And I'm still waiting for a few more things. I'm still waiting for a fuel pressure regulator that I ordered. Um, so I can actually connect that to the engine and um, give the engine fuel. Um, so that next, I, what I can do is I can actually start the engine and um, run my code scanner with it and see if everything is working normally. Okay, so it's the next week now and I did get my ESP module back. I've plugged that back in and I've also done a bit of playing around with all the wires and I'm um, going through the codes. And I have figured out quite a bit like um, what parts of the transmission I can disconnect, whether I can disconnect the SPC module or not. But I still haven't started the engine yet and I still haven't figured out whether the engine will work properly, like um, whether it's in some fail-safe mode or whether it's running perfectly normal. Um, so that's what I'm going to figure out right now. I have my code scan over there and I have fuel connected to the engine. By the way, this is a really sketchy way to do this. <laughs> Don't do this yourself. Um, I just have an external fuel pump over here. This is from a CL55 and there's a pipe going all the way to the bottom of the well, fuel tank and usually this is supposed to go at the bottom of the fuel tank but this fuel pump does have quite a bit of scavenging so it can suck up fuel anyways and i just have a fuel pressure regulator over here that is going to regulate the fuel pressure to 5.5 bar um, that's what this engine is supposed to run at and then there's a fuel line going to the engine that's how i'm supplying it fuel um, all the electronics are connected anyways and for the turbo drains right now they're just going in that tank i'm just going to start the engine for a few seconds anyways um, it's not going to, I'm not going to run it for too long because all I'm really trying to do is just um, start the engine and see what type of codes the engine gives me. So the first start was a bit of a rough start, that's just because of the air and the fuel lines, but after a while the idle did calm down. There was also a bit of smoke coming out of the exhaust manifold on the turbos. I wasn't sure whether the turbos were burning oil or whether that was just the oil left in the turbos, but the smoke did clear up later, so I'm guessing that's just the oil that was left in the turbos from before because the turbos had been lying around for so long. But my favorite part was the way the engine sounds with the turbos and the setup and everything. It sounded absolutely amazing. I know the camera doesn't do it too much justice, but hearing this in real life it was absolutely amazing. It's almost like a lion roaring at your face or something. That's the closest thing I can compare it to. That was super cool starting the engine like right outside the car and like actually seeing all the components moving the turbos and the flywheel and everything because you usually don't get to see all that um, but now it's time to actually go through the codes because there's quite a lot of codes that the engine threw there's 32 codes actually but most of them are the same thing like most of them it's this code i'll have to later check what this code is about um, well the good thing is that the code i was looking for which is load limit active that's a code that um it basically only enables the engine to run on like part power. Um, that code is not here so it seems like it's running normal. I'm gonna start the engine one more time and I'm gonna go through these um, values just to see what like just to see what type of values I'm getting from all the different sensors. So the second start was quite a bit more normal. The engine just started up just like it would regularly start up in a car and this time there was no smoke burning from the turbos or anything at all and even the values, all the different values from the different sensors were also looking pretty normal
So after running the engine for a bit, I'm pretty confident that the whole thing should be working fine because there's, well, there is a few codes there and um, I still have to go through some of the codes to see what they are about. Um, but yeah, most of the codes are just regarding the things that I have actually removed, like the secondary air injection system and um, the oxygen sensors that aren't there. Now, the only thing is that I can't put the engine under actual load. Um, like there's no way to actually like um, put load on the engine because this is not a dyno. I'm just, the most I can do is just rev the engine. Um, and even when I'm revving the engine, the engine really stays around 20% load, which is not that much. Um, so that's not going to be possible testing out with this setup. But other than that, other than like just testing out how the engine runs, like even disconnecting the transmission and seeing how the engine runs, um, I think everything is running pretty much normal. Talking about some of the things that I have figured out after playing with all these electronics, well, the first thing is that the transmission swap would be fairly easy because all I really need to do is when I um, unplug the transmission from here, like this is the only connector that goes to the transmission and I also unplug the gear lever the ECU doesn't do anything at all it just keeps the engine running the same way it is uh, however when I unplug the transmission module um, this is the transmission module over here by the way if I unplug this the engine does not start at all so what I'm planning to do is I'm gonna keep this module in there um, so it's connected with the engine uh, by the CAN bus but with, but disconnect the transmission. So that's really good. It's not even running in some fail-safe mode or anything. It's just running like it normally does. Um, I also tried disconnecting this module. Um, this is the uh, module for the air suspension since I don't even have an air suspension. And there's a whole bunch of wires that come out of here. So getting rid of all these wires, like most of this harness is going to be gone when I remove all these extra wires. The place where I might get in a bit of trouble is the SPC module because I've also been playing around with that module, like um, seeing what it would take to delete the SPC. And the only problem is that the real speed sensors, all the wires actually run through the SPC module. So the SPC module is the thing that picks up the readings from the real speed sensors and then it sends them to the ESP module that's over there. And then the ESP module actually interprets those values and then it sends that to the instrument cluster which actually shows you the speed. So with either of these modules gone, with the SPC module gone or with the ESP module gone, um, the, the speed doesn't work on the instrument cluster, it just shows zero. I have been playing around a bit with the real speed sensor, just giving it fake values and seeing what type of speed it shows and what type of numbers it shows on the instrument cluster. Because that would be really cool having the same instrument cluster in this car working perfectly like it does in the 55 But I think the problem is that I really do want to get rid of SPC. I, I don't feel like keeping it. Um, that's why I'm guessing I'll also lose that. And ESP, I want to get rid of it anyways because ESP is really annoying. Like it breaks individual wheels. Like if, you, if your car starts to drift, even if you have ESP off, it sometimes does kick in and it does uh, like um, break individual wheels just to straighten up the car. The problem with deleting those would be I would also lose my wheel speed sensors and I would also lose the speed reading on the instrument cluster. So that's something that I'll have to do something about. But the good thing is that even deleting the SPC module and even deleting the ESP module, the engine still runs the way it should run. Like that doesn't, um, um, all that doesn't um, affect the way the engine is running. So that's actually really good to see. Also to answer the question of standalone ECU that I've been getting an awful lot, that why don't throw all these electronics away and just replace them with a the standalone ECU. Well, personally, I think, th first of all, this way is way easier than going with the standalone ECU. Rather than throwing all these wires away and then going with the standalone ECU and wiring all the fuse boxes and, like, all the wires going to the fuel pump, wires going from the batteries, doing all that from scratch is actually a way harder way than keeping what's already in the car and then just getting rid of what I don't need. And also the benefit of this is that I get to keep other things along the way, like the instrument cluster, and also the steering column and all the other things, like the key would work. Um, so rather than going with a full standalone system and then having one of those crappy LED dashboards and um, a switch to turn on your car. I think it's a way better system to do it this way. And just to tell you, I might even go with an aftermarket ECU later on, not because I want to get rid of the whole wiring harness, just because it will give me more control over the engine, then I can actually change the rev limit on the engine, make the engine rev higher than it revs right now and all those things. Um, but the thing is that if I keep all this wiring harness and um, just move all of this to the car, even Installing a standalone ECU later is going to be much easier because I won't have to deal with like wiring everything up from scratch again. All the fuse boxes are already there. Um, all the wires are already there going all the way to the fuel pump, to the battery, to the alternator. All those circuits are already there. So yeah, in terms of that, I definitely think this is a better way of doing it. That's going to be everything for this video. I have a lot of cleaning to do before the next video. I got to get rid of all this wiring harness now, put that aside somewhere because uh, the next part that's coming up is going to be on installing this manual transmission, like connecting this transmission to the engine, which, by the way, also is not going to be an easy task. I need to make a custom flywheel adapter and then a custom 
um, bell housing adapter so yeah i'm gonna get to work on that right away and hopefully you guys should see that sometime maybe in a week from now or two weeks from now depending on how hard or how easy it turns out but yeah that's everything for now thanks for watching and see you in the next part